As you know, David Sproul is, is out of town. He's up in Tennessee, polishing the pulpit, from what I understand. It's, a, it's an excellent um, lectureship from what I've heard about it. So we hope to see some good things coming from David, even more so when he gets back in. But before he left to go out of town, he asked me if I would be so kind as to teach the class this evening. I said, hmm, let me think about that. And, and I took him up on it. So I hope you all will bear with me as we um, go into a study of Paul's writings from Romans chapter 6 this evening. Somewhere here I've got a little clicker. Here it is. It's up on the board. That's a good start. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to go ahead and look through this um, chapter 6 this evening. Um, in my Bible, it has a little subtitle under that chapter. It says, Believers in Christ are dead to sin but alive to God. And it's a very good study as you go through this with me tonight. Um, I hope you'll find that uh, you get some information out of it you may not have heard before or, or just not thought about before. So as an introduction, in Romans, Paul's address um, showed uh, the problem of sin in, in Romans. In the first two and a half chapters, he demonstrates that all have sinned. And we can read that in Romans 3, 21 through 24. If you want to turn there with me. And it says in verse 21 of chapter 3, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of, the, of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. And then finally in verse 23 and 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through, this, through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. Now, as we go further into uh, the book of Romans chapter 6, you find that uh, the next two and a half chapters, he declares how we can justify through faith in Jesus Christ. And that can be seen also in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. He then concludes that uh, introduction and by saying uh, that where sin is abound, grace abounds even more. And we can look at Romans 5, verse 21, or verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 reads, And the law came in that transgression might increase, but where sin is increased, grace aboundeth all the more. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul then anticipates an erroneous inference that's about to come up in his writing here. And for that, we're going to be reading in uh, Romans 6, verse 1 in just a second, but basically states, let's continue in sin that grace may abound. Sounds kind of foreign, doesn't it? So in verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? This is a conclusion that is, excuse me, this is a conclusion that is repulsive to Paul. And that can be seen in the second verse. <clears throat> May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now in a few minutes I'm going to be asking for some volunteers to help read with the reading. So if you can help me out with that, uh, 
when I ask, it would be a great uh, to speed things up. Okay, so today some Christians may live in a reference to sin as though they had the same idea as what Paul was stating. Living as though there is no need for the di- to be diligent in overcoming sin. Perhaps they reason, if I sin, I can simply confess and God will again forgive. In other words, continue in sin that grace may abound. And yet a careful study of Romans 6 reveals why such a thought is absurd. Paul provides four reasons why we should not continue in sin. When fully understood, they will prompt us to answer with Paul, certainly not. So then, shall we continue in sin? What say ye? (laughs) What does God think about it? Absolutely. Okay, so if I could get four hands, maybe from this side, I've got uh, some verses I'll give to you. Um, Can we start over there? Okay. Um, Is that Vic? Okay. The first one would be uh, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. I think I saw Dirk behind him. Uh, Romans 6 and verse 5. And then who else would like to help with that on that side? Michael? Um, Verses 6 and 7. Anybody else on that side? Okay, John. Uh, Verse 8 and 10. Okay, we'll be coming up to those in just a moment. Okay, it's already up there. But Paul writes, as an, in an answer to what God thinks about it, no, we died to sin. And that's uh, found in verse, verse 2, which we are, have already read. Okay, going on. We were crucified with Christ in baptism. And we'd like to go ahead and read that first verse there, Vic. Thank you. Baptism is a burial in the death of Christ. Baptism is where <clears throat> baptism is where we are crucified with Christ, and that's found in Romans six six, which we'll read about shortly. Thus, baptism, not repentance, is where we die to sin. Having been crucified with Christ. With Christ should impact how we live. And we can see this in Galatians verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 20. If you'd like to turn there. Verse 20 says, I have been, <clears throat> excuse me, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life by faith. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. We can now walk in newness of life as a result of being baptized into Christ. And we'll go ahead and read Romans 6 and 5 now. Okay, just as Christ rose from the grave, so we rise from baptism in, in, to walk in newness of life. We are now a new creature in Christ, new creation. And that can also be found in 2 Corinthians verse 5 and 17. We are no longer slaves of sin. That can be found in the next verse, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. 
primary purpose of dying in sin and baptism is to free ourselves from sin. This is a point Paul expounds upon a little later. We can now live with Christ, and that's found in the next verse, which is Romans verse six, or chapter 6, 8, and 10. Because we die with Christ, so we can. Let's look in uh, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then there's a question. The idea of being alive in Christ leads to Paul's second and most major point, in the response to the question of, shall we continue in sin? Can I get uh, three more volunteers, maybe from this section, for reading? Anybody like to read? How about from this side? David, okay. First one will be um, Romans uh, 6, verse 12. The next verse, um, who would like to do the next one? Michael. Michael. Uh, it's verse 13. Then, Ivan, you want to do uh, verse 14. Okay, great. Okay, that's the answer to that question that, that we just put out there. And it uh, comes back from Paul. No, we are alive to God. In Romans 6, verse 11, he says... Even so, consider yourselves to be dead in Christ, but alive to God in Christ. Now, let's go on to the first reading here. We've got sin does not have to be reign in us, and that's found in, verses, in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you would obey it in its lust. We who are dead in sin can now choose not to let it reign in us. We are no longer debtors to sin. And you can see that in Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Our bodies can now be instruments of righteousness, and that's found in verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of of righteousness to God. Did you all notice that that word that came into this verse? Members? Mm -hmm. Who would like to expand on what that particular word means in in this verse? Does it mean members of the church? That's right. Members of your body. That can be confused sometimes when we're reading through this and we see that word. So let's keep that in mind as we go through some more of this reading because you're going to see that pop up some more. We can present ourselves to God as alive from the dead and as instruments of righteousness to him. We can glorify him even with our bodies. And that can also be seen in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 
Now, God's grace frees us from sin's dominion. That's seen in the 14th verse of Romans 6. For sin shall not have dominion over you. We are not under law, but under grace. Sin no longer needs to be our master. In Christ, we have been set free. And you can see that in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, where it says... There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. See if I can catch up with my, with my um, PowerPoint here. And 619. Okay. Before that question popped up, I should have asked this again. This freedom is not a license to sin. On the contrary, consider Paul's third point out of four. In response to the question, shall we continue in sin? There's his answer. No, we are to be slaves of righteousness. And that's found in the 19th verse. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you are presented, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to the lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So then, we are slaves to whatever we obey. For this, I'd like to get uh, two more volunteers, if I could. Two more, Novell. Okay, that'd be uh, verse 15 and 16. And, okay. Okay, and would you like to do 17 and 18? We'll do those in just a moment. Um, Yes, still in the sixth chapter, and you'll be doing uh, 17 and 18 in just a moment. So if um, you could go ahead and read that uh, for us, Novell, 15 and 16. Thank you. God be thanked that through you, that though you were slaves of sin, sorry, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine in in which you were delivered. Okay, thank you. So is grace an excuse to sin? No, no. That's right, certainly not. We are either slaves of sin or slaves of what? Righteousness. That's right. If we continue in sin, we once again become slaves of sin. That's seen in John 8 and 34, as Jesus said there. We won't turn to that, but uh, if you'd like to do that later, you can. For the Christians to continue in sin makes things worse. We can see that in 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. In verse 20 of chapter 2 in Second Peter, For if after the having escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness 
than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. Okay, we we become slaves of righteousness, and we'll go ahead and read 17 and 18 again. Thank you. We were slaves of sin, but when we obeyed from the heart the doctrine, in other words, the gospel which com- commands baptism, we were set free from sin. Not just sin's condemnation, which can be seen in Acts 2.38, 22.16, and also in Romans 8, 1 and 2, but also sin's dominion, Romans 8, 12 and 13. We were set free from sin so we could become slaves of righteousness. Okay, in the 19th verse, we are to serve righteousness like we once served sin. I am speaking in human terms because the weakness of your flesh, it reads in verse 19, for just as you were presented, just as you presented your your members as slaves in purity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. We just read that a moment ago, but I think it bears good food to go ahead and, and read it again. Prior to becoming Christian, prior to becoming a Christian, we offered our bodies as slaves to sin. So now our bodies, so now offer our bodies as slaves of righteousness for the purpose of producing holiness. That's seen in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 and 16. Peter, or excuse me, Paul, in his fourth point, starts to begin to conclude his talk here in, in, in chapter 6. And asking in response to the question, shall, shall we continue in sin? And Paul states emphatically, no, the wages of sin is death. That's seen in Romans 6 and 23. We'll look at that in just a moment. <clears throat> the fruit of slavery to sin is death, which is seen in Romans 6, 20 and 21. Verse 20, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then der- deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. Now what what death are we talking about here? This this term death can be used in many different ways. What what are we meaning by death in this instance? Spiritual Spiritual death. And what does spiritual death mean to us as Christians? Separation from God. Absolutely. Separation from God. Living in sin separates us from God. Now. And that's also seen in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Back up. And the second point on that is dying in sin. And this is the strong point. Dying in sin will separate us from him for eternity. And you can read that that. In Revelations 21 and verse 8. It's a very strong verse. If you'd like to turn there, verses 20, Revelation 21, verse 8. Verse 8 reads, But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and abominable murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers, 
and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Doesn't sound like I'd want to be a part of that. How about you? Grace of God offers eternal life. We can read about that in uh, the 22nd and 23rd verse. But I'm going to hold the 23rd verse for just a moment. In, in the 22nd verse, by now having been freed from sin and slave to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. As I was um, preparing for this lesson this evening, I went through some of the books I have in my own library at home, and one of the ones that I, that I found there was this little new um, commentary on Paul's letters to the saints in Rome, and it was written by Robertson L. Whiteside. Um, he was born a long time ago. In fact, it was right after the Civil War, um, December 27th, 1869. But um, when you read through his commentary, he's very straight to the point in things that he says, and the way he reads it, and his studies have shown him <clears throat> in the Word. So when I went to um, Romans 6, and I looked at the 23rd verse, here's what he came up with. He asked a question, first of all, and it sounds fairly familiar. Even if you were permitted to go back under sin, would it pay? Compare the fruits of righteousness and the fruits of sin. Then he reads the 23rd verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I find this interesting what he says next. Sin pays in wages. God makes it a free gift. Not sin, but he makes his eternal life a free gift. If you serve sin, you need not doubt as to what your wages are to be, nor as to whether you will be paid in full. The final reward for your service to sin is eternal death. And if you serve sin, you must look to sin for your wages. However, then he says, eternal life is a free gift of God, as we said already. No man can perform service that will entitle him to eternal life as wages. In other words, you can't work your way to heaven. We all know that. It comes as a free gift to those that love and serve the Lord. I thought his commentary was very interesting and wanted to share that with you. <clears throat> so, by the grace of God... Or by his grace, we have been set free from sin, and that's via baptism, which can be seen in Romans 6 and 2 through 14, and Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. By his grace, we can now be slaves to God through continued obedience. That's found in Romans 6, 15 and 19, which we've already reviewed this evening. By his grace, we can bear the fruit of holiness, which in turn leads to eternal life. Seen in Romans 6, verse 22, and in 2, Romans 2, verses 4 through 11. So then in conclusion, shall we continue in sin? No. Absolutely not. If we understand what Paul has written in this chapter of Romans, then we will cry out with him, certainly not. And, and review again verses, six, or verses 2 and verse 15. This is what I pray for all of us, that we may develop, I'll back up one, that we may develop the same response as Paul to talking taking sin lightly. <clears throat> 
should not take sin lightly. Certainly not. Now, I didn't time this out. Went a lot faster than I thought. <coughs> but maybe there would be some questions that we could discuss. Um, if you have, have any that you'd, or comments that you'd like to add to the reading of chapter 6 in Romans, now would be the time to raise your hand. Jerry? <coughs> Absolutely. So on the other hand, Jim? I know she said you can't work your way into heaven. You can't do nothing to get there either. Well, well, we know there's some things that we do need to do to follow God's plan of salvation, certainly. And we can't just, and what you're saying is we can't just sit back and have him take us to heaven without yeah. doing anything. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Absolutely. Good points. And that's exactly the, the, the reason for him writing this entire chapter. You know, should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Did I see another hand over this way? No? Any other comments or questions possibly? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. When we, when we hear about grace, uh, how God um, you know, blesses us with his grace to save us eternally, well, it's not just a, it, it is a free gift, but it's not just something that uh, you sit back, like Jim was saying, you don't just sit back and wait for it to hit you. You, know, you, need, to, you need to believe, repent, be baptized, and live a faithful life. And um, it's the putting on Jesus Christ in baptism that takes those sins away from us and gives us that grace that God has out there freely to give to us. Thank you, Jerry. Good point. Um, one, of the, one of the main things that hit me, I mentioned it earlier uh, as I was studying this, is when we get into uh, the, the word members, you know, um, when you think about having your bodily members, your hands, your eyes, your ears, your feet, whatever you have available to you, kind of you get an extension of that also with your car, your home, you know, your children. Um, you can use those, all of those things I've mentioned, your body and, your, and the things you have and, and your family, you can use them towards sin or you can use them towards righteousness. Righteousness. 
And when you apply them towards righteousness, you're showing your love for God and you're showing him, you know, what, how much you do love him and increases your, your wealth with, with God. When I say wealth, I mean, you know, God loves you even that much more. Jim? When you talk about the body, you think of Jesus is describing if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your arm or hand cut it off. And these are members that we use sometimes to do sin with. It. And uh, we don't realize the importance of our bodies in the actions that we portray to others and how we act. Absolutely. Good point. Very good. Yes. Uh, I just, when I read that, I like to, I like the fact that he used the word continuously sin, because we are sinners, and we will sin. It's just a matter of lingering, laying, saying I can stay there mm -hmm. just because of grace. God forgives that. He wants us even Continue. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting when you think about the love of Christ and what He did for us on the cross, how He shed His blood so that our sins could be redeemed and taken away. That's a continual thing with us as long as we're not continuing in sin. Okay, so God can't look at us if we if we have sin. We know that He's His nature is such that He can't look on sin. So we can feel comfortable in knowing that God, through Jesus and his blood, is continually cleansing us, keeping us free from sin, as long as we don't put ourselves continually in sin and go about sort of how they were looking at it in Rome. You know, well, we'll just sin more so that grace can take those sins away. Well, that's not what God had in mind. Not at all. Any other comments? Okay, well that's five minutes, so you're gonna even get you're even gonna get an extra five minutes. Because I'm done. <laughs> but it has been a pleasure. Um, it's amazing, you know, I hear people say it all the time that when you uh, when you develop a lesson, how much you you get out of it, you know, in putting it together. And I hope you all uh, got even a fraction of what I got out of it in preparing it to bring to you tonight. Thank you so much for your attention.